On this episode of AV Week, we talk about new standards for hearing assistance, Dante support for AES 67, and Infocom 2018 is getting into the AR VR. All this and more on AV Week. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. This is AV Week, episode 347, Standard Issue. Support for AV Nation is brought to you by Christy Digital and by Crestron. And welcome everybody to another edition of AV Week, your source for news and information on the AV integration industry. I'm your host, George Tucker. Thanks for joining us. Each week we cover stories relevant to the AV industry and we ask people to comment on them in the industry. And one of the good things that I get to do is talk to really smart and entertaining people. And this week is up on that order of high level. So joining us today is Mike Tomei. He is the principal at Tomei AV Consulting. Welcome, sir. Hey, George. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been a while since we've last talked. You were on uh, EdTech a lot lately. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Also joining us is Dawn Mead. She is senior AV architect and project manager at a leading aerospace and defense contractor. Yep. Hi. How are, how's everybody? Good to see you as well. It's been way <laughs> too long. It has, definitely. Yes. And of course, last but not least, Victoria Ferrari. She is account executive at Netrix LLC. That was formerly Synergy. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Happy to be on. All right. So let's get this started from our friends at AV Magazine. A new standard calls for AV expertise to hearing impaired. The gist of this article is about the hearing impaired assistance regulation called BS8300. It's a law that is an extension of the European or the UK Equal Equalities Act of 2010 and they're part M of building regulations. That's very similar to our US ADA regulations. Uh, it concerns the hearing assistance loops and is aimed at a more specific rules of implementation and the skill sets required. Now this is something very similar to many years ago when say Infocom and Cedia, okay, they weren't technically fighting, but they were working on legislations that made their certifications the ones that would be required for low voltage guys. I think this is a very similar situation. The article takes pains to point out that instead of having the electricians put this in, they want to have qualified low voltage folks for various and sundry reasons. Dawn, I'll start with you. Again, that taking away from electricians, are we being defensive in this idea with the industry or is there a really need to do that with these hearing loops? I, there, there is an element of self-defense in there, you know, making sure that we're still part of the game. But I think realistically, there is a, a call for keeping AV people involved in this. Uh, I just recently made the shift from an integrator to an end user, and it's really, really opened my eyes just in the past four months how many things we know that you think everybody knows and they just don't. And some of those things include rules like ADA and these European laws, British laws, that have to do with audio, video, um, space requirements, and also how much our knowledge of acoustics and how much of our knowledge of optics come into play. You know, I don't think about the fact that I know all of these random numbers and thoughts and formulas. It just is part of what I do now. I, you know, it's second nature, and it doesn't occur to me that other people don't know that until you're meeting with 30 people in an IT department that are looking at you as the expert because they don't have a clue. So I, I think it's really important to know that the person installing your hearing loops, particularly in public spaces like movie theaters, like um, you know bank queues, things like that, that, that they understand the acoustics of the thing. You're gonna have a completely different experience with a hearing loop in a nice movie theater with padded seats and padded walls and, and you know, all, all the carpets and drapes that come in movie theaters and, and, and even public, you know, theater theaters versus a bank with marble floors and marble walls and glass in front of the teller so they don't get shot and you're doing a ceiling loop. So I, I think it's very important to have that knowledge of acoustics and AV expertise when going in. Mike, Dawn points out, you know, a good 
a good argument for having an AV integrator, right? This does fall back a little bit on the AV IT who has ownership of certain parts of these installations. Uh, but the provisions call for a market for the market for us, the integrators to have ownership of the system. Now this is a European one, but it can be very similar here in which they're basically saying, if the system fails, you must be the one who makes sure that it gets up and running immediately because having anyone not have equal access is a fiscal responsibility. There could be penalties to this. Does that feel like an undue burden for the AV industry? Uh, what does that do to our bottom line? And, and are we now having to sort of cleave our staff so that one's a lower paid and that's all they do? And is that something you really want to get into? Yeah, it seems a little... Uh, strict to put that on the AV integrator. Um, seems like uh, the owner, I mean, in the US, it, it really seems like the owner is responsible um, for maintaining those systems. And, um, you know, this is a, a subject that I spend a lot of time thinking about because for the past couple of years, I have taught uh, an ADA class at Infocom. And um, I, I work with a lot of higher ed clients just because of my background. And um, ADA is huge in higher ed because these are public gathering areas and um every year i can i can spend you know hours talking about reach ranges and um you know turning radiuses and things like that for wheelchairs but uh, everybody wants to hear about uh hearing assist in these classes because it's such a huge topic right now and there are so many schools that are out of compliance um that just don't have anything in their classrooms installed much less loop systems um so it really needs to be the owner that I believe, um, you know, really kind of takes control and make sure those systems are up and running and always available um, when they're needed. But there's a lot of clients that just don't pay any attention to um, hearing assist, um, much less uh, any ADA rules or standards when, um, when it comes to AV installations. So it's like a really big thing for AV designers to start thinking about and the owners have to be the ones pushing it because a lot of times, um, I don't think that AV designers or integrators are going to push it as much as the owners really should. Hmm. And George, if I could hop in a second um, off, off of what Mike said, I, I don't. I would like to read the full text of the the rule that that says that it's on the AV person, because if you have a public space where there is no AV integrator, where there is no current AV, how are you going to hold an integrator responsible for lack of compliance? Ultimately, all responsibility for a public space falls on that owner, and it's the owner's responsibility to contact the AV company if something fails. Now, it's the AV company's responsibility absolutely to get it up and running as quickly as possible when they're notified, you know, but um, I, I think that there's sort of a shared responsibility. I, just coming from the integrator world, I wouldn't balk at having responsibility for a system I put in, so long as that there is some owner responsibility as well to notify me to, you know, ultimately make sure that it's taken care of. Yeah. I agree that there should be shared um, responsibility, but also um, I feel that it should be a little more 60-40 and 60 on the integrator. And you can do that by offering services, you know, um, managed services, service contracts, and doing preventive maintenance. Um, you know, I think with a feature such as um, help, helping the hearing impaired, you know, that it has to be done by an AV professional. Um, you know, as, as our industry, as more and more pieces of our industry become commoditized, I feel that audio is really where we shine because it is so specialized. There's so much science behind it. Um, and that it should be our responsibility to, to take ownership of those types of things. So I think it's good that there are um, you know, governance um, and compliance standards, but not only that, that it has to be there, but this standard from what I read, they, they give specific instructions on you know, the installation and certain features and specifications. And I think that that really is a good thing because it holds um, the integrator accountable, but then also, you know, a GC looks at the spec is like, oh, I don't have anybody in my wheelhouse that can do this. I've got to go find an AV integrator. So it brings, it allows for AV integrators to come into projects earlier, um, which is always our struggle. It's something that we want. And, you know, so I think it's, I think it's definitely a good thing. 
Well, so from that, Victoria, I'll, I'll take it. One of my next questions, the last questions on this topic is go, do, do these kind of standards help or hinder us? Because they are so very specific. And I wonder, is that degree of specificity, that, that sort of granular, it'll only be this bend of a ratio and it only goes this far, is, is that really helpful in the end? Or is, is that just more regulation so everyone covers their own butt if something happens? I'd have to, like Don said, I'd have to really read into the mm. specifications. Um, you know, if they have just some general generalities of, you know, these certain particular features, but you know, you're right. I mean, every space is different, you know, and if you're doing live sound or music versus, you know, um, spoken word, you know, there, there's, um, I mean, audio is so complex and, you know, it, for the hearing impaired, it should be a separate mix, you know, because for example, you're watching a band and, you know, you have the house mix in, in your hearing loop or whatever, but you've got the lead guitar player with his amp on stage and he's cranked up, you know, and so the, we want to try to make the experience um, as, as close to the same for everyone. And so there are going to be some special things that need to be done. And I don't know if the standards cover that. Um, but, you know, if they do just have some general specific features, um, I think that's good. Well, you dovetail right into the next story about audio being so very important. And I have some questions on that. But first, let's get to the story from our friends at Commercial Integrator. Audinate announces AES67 support for the Dante Ultimo chipset and SEMPTI support across Dante platforms. All right, so there's a lot here to unpack. But in essence, what it's basically saying is that the Dante Ultimo firmware, so it's a firmware update, adds the ability for these products to send audio streams to other non-Dante products that use AES67 standard. This is according to the direct Audinate announcement. So Mike, I'm gonna start with you. Victoria stated that it's such a complex thing, but is not video more complex? Why are we focusing on an audio only transport? Now I'm a two channel guy, I love this, but as an industry standard, why is this the penultimate say over AVB? Yeah, so on one hand, it's nice that, you know, people like Dante are playing well with others and there's interoperability between all of these different standards, um, but it is just, a, like you said, a kind of a conglomeration of all these standards that have to be all merged together and nobody's really picking and choosing one to kind of go with. I mean, Dante has definitely um, done really well in, in certain markets, but then um, you look at other markets like broadcast or um, that sort of thing. And, and there are other audio standards that are, are prevalent in there too. So it's tough. Well, video, I think, is um, getting there. You know, we, like you said, you have AVB and um, you have some other kind of video standards, a lot of uh, all proprietary, um, you know, I guess you can call them standards at the moment um, that are kind of falling into place. And um, it's taking a while. It's, I think it's, um, it's frustrating for sure in the industry to have all of these standards kind of flying around and nobody really picking and choosing. And um, it's tough for a lot of companies to play well together. You know, there are certain um, companies that are banding together and creating these um, these groups that are agreeing on a certain standard, but then there are large uh, manufacturers that are holding out and sticking with their own uh, proprietary formats. And um, it's just uh, the nature of a commercial industry, but um, it definitely hurts it. And um, it, it it's really hard to kind of, as a designer, um, to look to the future and, and say, okay, who's going to win this war? And um, where should I be telling my clients they should be spending their money? So right. So, so Don, let, let me continue that, that thought that Mike was having about how so many standards, it's, it's a sort of double-edged sword. We know that having proprietary standards helps grow certain segments because there's a desire for it. And therefore, once it builds up enough steam, other companies want to get into the act. But what it looks like we're doing again is relying on a third party standards organization, albeit the Audio Engineering Society, no joke there, of a, of a standards organization to develop a way for us to talk to each other. So is having an open standard protocol a help or a hindrance in this case? Uh, where does that demarcation line happen where we go, all right, guys, we all got to talk to each other. We either have to share the same standard or, or do the what? The MIDI route. I know I say this all the time to people, the MIDI protocol. 
allowed everybody to do what they need to do. Why aren't we doing that? Well, if the one job I haven't had in the industry is the manufacturer, so I couldn't answer that last question, why we're not doing that. Um, but I, you know, I think that the importance of standards is, is more clear from this side of the fence as an end user. And that's if you're not super familiar with the industry or not super familiar with how performance should be for any particular product, having the standards and having documented standards give you a benchmark that you can do your commissioning against. They give you a benchmark that you can use in your RFQs and your SOWs, your RFPs. Um, it really provides a framework for end users to build on. And so you don't have to have the knowledge, but you have to say, I know that this knowledge base exists and therefore I require you to have this knowledge base in order to do the job properly. Um, and I, I think that's invaluable. Um, as to which standards or whether we use a proprietary standard versus an open standard, you know, the manufacturers are going to fight that out. Looking at the computer industry, because, you know, convergence is 10 years in our rearview mirror, I now directly report to the head of IT for my sector here. You know, I, IT has had open standards across the board, Apple notwithstanding, you know, any PC from any company will work together. They have certain standards they adhere to. My very first computer, I'm dating myself, back in the 90s, was a Packard Bell that didn't adhere to standards. And when my motherboard went up, I had to get a Packard Bell motherboard because no other motherboards fit in there. It didn't match the standard. And if I needed a new plug, it wasn't a standard plug. So I had to get their plug if you could find it. So, you know, the, the open standards thing is not new. It's not new to the tech world at large, but it's seeming, I mean, we, you know, we act like it's new to us, but it really isn't even new to AV. You know, we're on our second revision already of some of the VIXA standards with ANSI and stuff. So, you know, granted, like everything else in AV, we're slow to drag our feet to adopt things, but the standards are out there. It's a matter of using them and it's a matter of, of getting on board the train because this is the way the rest of the world operates. If we want to remain relevant, and not be replaced by the electricians and the structured cable guys and the IT guys of the world, we have to jump on that bandwagon and learn to love standards and learn to use them. And I, I think, you know, if, if Dante's, you know, jumping on board the standard for the Society of, uh, what is it, the engineers, uh, the SMPTE and the, and the AES, you know, American engineering, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> Those guys. <laughs> Those guys want no sound. Yeah. Um, you know, we're jumping on board these standards. That's for the good. That means that Dante might win if another transport in our industry doesn't jump on their standards. So oh, I think it just gives them a leg up in the market. So Victoria, you you touched on this at the beginning of this conversation, but why do I care about AES sixty seven? Do I really care about an audio only protocol? Why? Um, audio is important, you know, um, it's, it really is, it's something that, you know, the average person doesn't understand, but, um, it affects them in a way that they don't even realize, you know, um, I think that audio, a lot of times, you know, even me, I, I'm learning more and, and becoming more of an audio file because my husband is a live sound engineer and as he's upgrading our living room, you know, he's, um, he's doing all these things like changing the acoustics in the room and, you know, he puts like pink noise through the speakers and he like adjusts the levels of the bass. And we, I mean, it's, and then we go from watching a movie, you know, on our old system to now watching it on our new system. And it's almost like the video looks better with better audio. It's like that, you know, it's, it's crazy how people don't realize the difference between good and really good in audio. And I think that, um, you know, having standards, like Don said, you know, the IT industry has been doing it. It's the way of the world. And, you know, it, you know, when you, it, when you think about like our video connections, right, how many different connections do we have? HDMI, DisplayPort, you know, mini DisplayPort and, you know, coax and I mean, all of the old analog signals, so many different ways to transport video. But in the IT world, it's one cable, it's one connection, it's RJ45. And, you know, we've got to get on that on that bus because, you know, it's the way the world's going. 
All right. Well, you know, actually, you actually gave me another great segue into the next article. Uh, you mentioned uh, unknown effects, like we don't realize the effect that it has on us. And from our friends again at AV Magazine, they are describing about Infocom 2018 announces center stage speaker lineup. Uh, to quote from the article, the center stage sessions will explore how to increase audience engagement through personalized and immersive experiences by way of augmented reality, virtual reality, wearable technologies, human-centered user interfaces, and more. I think this also includes sort of IoT-centric themes here, right? Uh, it sounds like a really good seminar. In fact, it probably could be a seminar that we go to just for a day on that one. Uh, Mike, I'm going to start with you on this. Can you provide me a counter argument that states that AR and VR is now actually absolutely part of the integrators uh, toolkit or the tools that we have to understand? Yeah, I mean, well, I'm living it right now. So I have a, uh, a project that I'm working on for a uh, community college here in central New York. And um, the uh, VR is a big part of it because um, they're looking to really um, create a classroom of the future, um, really market the school to incoming students when they are taking their tours. Um, you, you know, like they said, these students are, are coming for uh, tours of the college and they're looking at uh, technology and they're thinking in their head, we have better technology and better classrooms at our high school than these colleges do. Um, and, you know, so we are, um, actually incorporating, it, it's, it's a uh, science department uh, that kind of owns this classroom. So we're incorporating uh, VR into the room and um, we created a, a large active learning classroom and then a uh, separate VR lab attached to it using part of the space that was available. So um, it's here and it's happening. And when I started the project, VR really wasn't on the table. We just were looking to create an active learning classroom. And um, once the VR discussion started happening, um, the client really looked to me for some direction. And, um, you know, even though in the past we would have said, well, this doesn't necessarily fall into AV design and, you know, I'm just going to do my projectors and sound system. Um, now they're looking to me for some direction and um, we're working together to create this uh, VR environment um, and VR lab for them. Um, so it's huge. And the biggest hurdle that we've run into is that, you um, I can you know, specify a whole bunch of great VR equipment uh, to throw in this room, but what kind of content are we gonna show in there? Um, there's a lot of content that's available already for download, or um, a lot of these institutions are creating their own, you know, research institutions are creating their own VR content and um, employing some of their computer science or graphic design students um, to create content for them. So that was the biggest hurdle, was really like figuring out, okay, what do we really wanna put in here and what do the faculty really want in here. So I think these um, seminars that are going to be happening in Infocom are going to be really big with the um, higher ed technology managers. I think that they're really going to jump on those VR and AR um, seminars and a couple of them look like they were talking just about content. So I think um, those are going to be really big. Interesting. Uh, you know, I'm going to go back to you, Victoria, because it seems to also ride on something you said. A lot of these a seminar subjects or the, 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 the center stage subjects deal with the psychology and system interaction or the psychology of system interaction. Now you mentioned an unknown effect because the audio makes it look better. Uh, what can we do to make sure that our AV integrators from top to bottom actually understand that concept? I mean, we kind of get it with lighting, but we still don't really have that where guys understand how lighting affects the home and the feeling. We all deal in a commercial world as well. Where does that apply and how do we get our ground troops to be able to understand that and always keep that present in their mind when they're designing and implementing the systems? I think it really, it, it starts with conversation at the end user level and not just decision makers, but you know, polling and getting, talking to an organization not only about you know their business goals and what they're trying to accomplish with the audio with the AV in a space. Um, now, I, what I, my experience is always corporate, so that's how I look at it. But you know, doing the research on the front end and really finding out you know how are the end users expecting to what the, what are they expecting the experience to be in these rooms and making sure that we deliver that um, in a way that's you know easy and simple to use 
um, and that you know makes people want to go in and and use those rooms that the company spent so much money on. Um, so I think that is a big factor is you know educating ourselves on our clients and what what do they want um, and what are they trying to accomplish and then trying to guide them a little bit you know if they want something crazy of course um, but I think that I feel that a lot of integrators don't do enough homework on the front end um, in in research with the actual people who are going to use the rooms yeah a little bit beyond just the technology but how one experiences it I'm sure a lot of us will are ignoring this side of it but then get really frustrated with poor you know interface design or poor uh, communication portals for our for the companies we want to talk to and not realizing that's exactly what we have to keep in mind every time we do it. Uh, Dawn, I'm going to pose a really hard question to you. Oh, goody. <laughs> yeah. Well, but as integrators, both commercial and in the residential world, especially a lot of these systems that Infocom is showing in the center stage, these deal with data, data acquisition, understanding how these interactions result in a common or a anticipated action. So we're going to be recording and not just their movements, but what they watch and when they watch and how they watch and where do we come to, how do we, I guess is the better question, deal with the fact that we are going to be the torchbearers, the holders of this data. Are we going to hand it off to someone else or is this really an opportunity to maybe take something back from the IT world? Hmm. <laughs> that was a good question. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, I think there'll be a portion of data that you'll be able to keep. But again, speaking now as an end user, I think that there'll be sort of a given or an understanding that the users will have access to the data. And, you know, we will get the reports or we would be able to get it, log in and, and monitor what they're doing in this conference room or you can check on what your kid's watching when he has a day off from school and you're at work or you know that sort of thing the user will need those metrics even more than we will i'm still saying we like i'm an integrator still yeah. it's a new position but uh, more than the integrators you know the integrators will want to know are they using certain equipment will we be able to sell more of those big expensive fancy blah blahs yeah that's good info to have that's good data to have but the real value in the data collected by these systems is in the users, in an organization like mine within this company, to know which conference rooms are booked more often, mm -hmm. to know which systems are used and which systems are not used, and which features within those systems are used. If we're paying $100,000 for a particular setup in a room, and we find out that the same thing could be accomplished based on the metrics with a $50,000 system, Hey, guess what? We're going to be heroes to the, to the the few people who use it, but not in every conference room. You know, those sorts of decisions, those sorts of of granular knowledge of the use of the system is what the data is about. And I think the end users will get more value with that. And even the home people, like I said, you'll know if the kids watching a channel he's not supposed to watch when you're not home. Or, you know, forget nanny cam, you can find out exactly what they're surfing and if they're using their, your Netflix and, and, you know, what they're listening to and what they're exposing your child to. You know, there, there's a lot of info that can be found there that mm -hmm. are, that is of import to the end user. So I think that's where the value is going to lay. And it would be your job, not our, our job is the AV professional to provide that data to the end user whether you do that as a separate service and charge them for it, whether you just give them their system and say, by the way, here's where you find all your metrics and your big data, you know, that that's up to the individual to figure out. Maybe people pay for it. Maybe they won't. If they were smart, they would, but you know, they might say hey, much like who owns the code, God help us bringing up that topic. <laughs> well, we just bought this system. We paid for all that equipment. So the data is ours. Why are you telling me I have to pay extra for my data of my system in my house or my conference room? So I'll leave that can of worms for the next show, but uh, th that's kind of my thoughts on it. Well, you can also probably, there's a good show on it for state of control with, uh, um, I'm sorry, just the state of control, a show here that they go over that topic a couple of times and it's really interesting ideas. Mike, I'm going to give you the final word here. What, how much data is too much data to monitor? 
I, well, I think that's where the, the money is for the integrators. So uh, like Don was saying, who, who owns that data? You know, it's, it's your system. Um, you would think you own it, which you do um, as an end user. But um, are you going to take the time to um, kind of tabulate all that data and collect it all and present it all? Um, and that's where the integrators come into play when they offer these services, um, these monitoring and kind of data collection services for clients. Um, and then they can just feed them back easily digestible information. You know, like I mentioned, I, I work a lot in the higher ed world and um, the data is huge with higher ed. You know, if you can go to a CIO and say, look, you know, we have um, this amount of classrooms and um, here's the hard numbers of, of the usage and we need to, um, you know, we need more money for these uh, AV upgrades. And um, here's our exact usage numbers, um, all tabulated. That's what they want. And they'll be able to go to the um, to the higher ups and ask for more money. And it's like so tabulating that data is um, where the where the money is. I don't think that, you know, we, we need all that data. Like, I love it. You know, being able to to come up with these numbers now back in the past, it was like, oh, I, you know, probably people are using we could look at lamp hours on a projector. <laughs> And um, that's all we can give you. So, um, you know, what if somebody left it on over the weekend? Well, all right. So that's not a good number. But uh, that's all we had in the past. So now um, it's great that we're able to um, connect all these devices and pull all this data. So I like cool. it. Yep. Well, we have to leave it at that because we've run out of time for today. I want to thank my guests for joining us today for a really good conversation. Again, Mike, uh, where can they find more about you and what you do? Well, my uh, website is tomeav.com. That's T-O-M-E-I-A-V.com. Or um, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm always on there. There you go. Dawn, where can we find out more about what you're doing, where you're going to be, and all that stuff? Well, I can tell you right now, thanks for the intro for a nice shameless plug. I will be at Infocom my first time as an end user. But as other years, I am teaching. So if you're in a class on recurring revenue things look me up i'm teaching a class on wednesday at infocom for infocom for avixa um so look that one up i'll also be running around the show with my friends for maybe nation and uh, doing some end user things as well um can't give you my email here but i can certainly let you know that i'm always on linkedin under dawn mead and i am of course on twitter at av dawn where all of my opinions are my own and what no no information about your next band uh competition uh well that's coming up in uh next not tomorrow but the weekend after down in richmond so if you have or uh down in norfolk if you're in the norfolk area and go to the virginia tattoo come see my pipe band play because there you go pipe yeah very cool and victoria ferrari victoria where can we find out more about what you're doing and your musings so um as don all my opinions are my own as well um, but you can find me on twitter victoria0429 i'm also on linkedin and you can check out my company website which is metricsllc.com very cool and i am george tucker i am here with av nation but you can follow me on well any of the social media platforms at tucker twos i also write for a number of trade magazines please tell them how much you like them no really i'll give you a and wooden nickel for each one. I appreciate it. Uh, but thank you again for watching. This has been AV Week on avnation.tv. You can go to avnation.tv and find a host of other shows about the market verticals in the integration industry. We appreciate there. And while you're there, we have a number of underwriters and sponsors who get us on the air and keep us uh, going and rent in the studios and all that kind of stuff. So if you stop by and give them a little thank you, we'd appreciate it. And I'm sure they'd love to hear from you. So for my guests and for AV Week and AV Nation TV, thank you for watching and we'll speak to you all very soon. Thank you.